Thank you for having me. That was a nice introduction. I think I could just sit down. He basically just told you all everything. Just kidding. Um, okay, so I have a quick video just to kind of like give you guys a little briefing of beginning to where we're at now. And my goal today really is to give you guys some really good, valuable information. I think this class is awesome. I wish I would have had something like this before I started my company because I feel like it's really valuable and you can hopefully learn a lot from me and others like me that have made a lot of mistakes and then also have triumphed. So we'll just get started here with the video. I don't know where, do you want me to just push play? So there you have it. This is kind of my whole story in a nutshell. Um, hopefully you guys can kind of get a grasp of what we do and what we're all about. And it's always nice to see kind of like a visual. I know some of you don't have kids, but maybe nieces, nephews. Some of you might have kids. Um, anyway, so when I first got the email from Nate, he sent over a bunch of questions um, that he kind of wanted me to touch on. And I want to make this really relevant to you guys. Um, because obviously for me, I'm a mom, I have kids, that's kind of like where I started. I know that market more than anything because I am that market, I'm, I'm my own consumer. Um, so hopefully I can take what they wanted me to cover and you guys can learn something from me. And, and ho at the end, if we have time, which I think we will, I'll open it up and anybody is welcome to ask any questions if you have any. Um, but 
a little bit about me personally, as you know, I am actually from Utah. I grew up in Alpine. My husband attended law school at the U, but we believe blue, so <laughs> Joel. Uh, my brother-in-law is actually the head coach here for the volleyball. I know that I recognize you, you play for him. Is there anybody else on the team in here? No, just you? So my brother-in-law is Sean Olmstead, um, and he coaches here at BYU, so we're mega fans of BYU and their programs. And then my sister, she's here, she played here at soccer on the team, so we're, we're mega BYU fans. Anyway. So, grew up in Alpine, Utah, uh, got married at 21. I actually went to college, but I didn't finish. I just got my associates. I played soccer at UVU, and then I hurt my knee, so I, and I wasn't really, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I was into fashion, and I didn't know that there was such a market for that. So, I ended up not finishing college, um, and my dad started a company when I was 21. And just so y'all know, I was on Shark Tank, but I think this is more nerve-wracking than that show. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, anyway, so my dad started a company when I was just recently married, like brand new married. I was 21. I was like a punk, and bless his heart, he, he was like running at a negative in this company, and everybody that he had invested in walked away. So he came to me and asked me if I could help him run this company. And I literally went from like cashier to, I was managing and operating three restaurants. It was brutal. I don't know if anybody knows anything about the restaurant business, but it's freaking brutal. So I ended up like just kind of teaching myself and there was a ton of lessons that I learned. I did that for five years. And I think in the first month, I had to look at the cost because he was literally bleeding and he needed my help. So I had to look at all the costs and all of the overhead and stop the bleeding. And we went from a negative to a positive within one month just because I could help him get on top of the numbers. Um, I only tell you this because, like I said, I didn't finish college, but I always thank him. Like, I know that probably cost you a lot of money. Like, you probably didn't make a ton, but you paid for a great education. And I learned a lot. And it prepared me for what I'm doing today. There's actually several things that prepared me for this, but that was a huge thing. Um, so, I got started, my company's Rags to Rachis. Um, I've always been like into fashion and I made my wedding dress. I actually used to make clothes for adults. I don't know if anybody remembers JMR. It was like a really cool, hip boutique up in Salt Lake. And when I was 19, I walked into JMR one day and I was wearing a shirt. And back then, the shirts were like really, I mean, they're probably like now in style. I don't get it, but they're like bare midriff. And I didn't like that, so I made longer shirts that were longer and they fit better. And I walked into JMR and the owner of the company happened to be there and, and the employee that was working at the time asked me, where'd you get your shirt? And I was like, oh, I made it. And the guy that bought the clothing for JMR, JMR was like biggest thing to me at, the, at that time. So he was like, hey, I want you to make us those shirts and sell them here. So I was so stoked. I was like, yeah, I'll totally do that. <laughs> So like, <laughs> went home, figured it all out. I remember my dad just being super excited, like, holy crap, she's gonna, like 19, she's gonna start sewing shirts. Ended up getting to a point where I was in school, like you guys, I was at EVU, and I would see people walking through the halls wearing my shirts. It was super cool, extra validating. But the problem with it was I was sewing probably, it got up to like 500 a week, and I was doing it all by myself. And I would take the shirts to JMR, I'd drop them off, and they would give me 50% of my money. And then they would take a 50% of my profit. And I was literally blood, sweat, and tears over every single shirt. So eventually, it was kind of inevitable, I burned out. I, didn't, I was literally living at my sewing machine. And I learned a really valuable lesson, and that was I don't belong behind a sewing machine. So I, I stepped away, and I just lived life. You know, I was young, and I was dating, and I was having fun. I got married at 21, and I ended up running the restaurants for a little while. Then I had my first boy, and I started making clothing for him. And um, fast forward, I have two other boys, so I had three boys total. And um, my husband was attending grad school, so he was up at the U and he was going to be an attorney, and they, we literally were broke. Like, uh, he was going to be done with school in May, and I remember in April, I was like, holy cow, what are we going to do when you're done with school? You've got to study for the bar, 
and we're not going to have any money. Like, your student loans run out, and we have a family. Like, we got to support this family. What am I going to do? So I started an Instagram, and I called it Rags to Rages. And I started selling their hand-me-down clothes. I got their clothes, got them out of the boxes. I got, like, the best-looking ones. I went to Home Depot, bought like a whiteboard, so it looked really clean and nice, and got my iPhone. iPhones are awesome, because they have good quality at least. And I was taking pictures of their clothes and I was selling them. And as I was selling them, I noticed that everything that I was selling was the stuff that I had made for my kids. And I remember, I, I remember it perfectly. I was laying in bed, and at four in the morning, I literally woke up from a dead sleep, and like somebody hit me in the head and was like, Rachel, this is what you have to do. You have to sell clothes through Instagram. Like, it's free, and you get all of the profit. You don't have to give up 50% of your, of your profit. You, it's direct consumer. You can take everything. So I was so stoked. I got up. I got my laptop out. I opened it up. I created a business plan. I could not go back to sleep. I was like, I, I'm on to something. So kids woke up, like, set out, got all the stuff I needed. Like I said, I went to Home Depot. I got, like, a big whiteboard I knew I needed to make it look really clean and really cool and professional. I got, um, I took the money that I had made from their hand-me-downs and I bought new inventory and I started creating shirts from scratch so they weren't hand-me-downs anymore. And the response was awesome. People loved it. Um, and in, in the midst of all of this, I have, I had almost, a, a, he was almost one. And he's crazy, like, I, I don't know if you guys have seen a one-year-old, but they literally crawl and they're crazy. They're like, and boys, for whatever reason, are crazier, I think. He wouldn't sit still. So um, I love the functionality of a one piece, but I hated the snaps around the bottom. But I love the fact that it was a one piece piece of clothing. I didn't have to think about a shirt or pants. It seemed really comfortable, and it was easy, like it was thoughtless. But I hated this, the hassle of snapping the snaps. So like when my husband would change Harrison's diaper, he would just get over it because Harrison was rolling all over the place. He would just leave it unsnapped and Harrison would end up running around the house with like no snaps dress, like he looked homeless. <laughs> so finally I was like, okay, I gotta like, I wanna come up with something that I can put on my kid that would be cute, functional, fashionable, um, yeah, and stylish. So I grabbed one of my husband's t-shirts, like an American Apparel rugged t-shirt, and I cut into it a romper and I went and sewed it. And I put it on Harrison, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Like, he looks amazing. He's super comfortable. I just had to slide it up and down, like, this is it. I'm stoked. I didn't even think about selling it at that point. But I took a picture of him in it, and I posted it on my Instagram, just because I had built an audience. I think I had, like, 2,000 followers at that point. And I posted it of him, and everybody asked, where in the heck did you get that one piece? So again, it dawned on me, holy cow, I should totally sell these. So I sewed all of my husband's t-shirts, just kidding. I didn't. <laughs> but, so I went and I got a ton of t-shirts in bulk, and I ended up cutting out t-shirts and making them into rompers. And at this, time, at this point, I didn't have like a website. I was literally selling them through Instagram. They would just leave their PayPal email and I would invoice them. So I was gearing up for like this PayPal, or this Instagram sell, and I ended up selling like $2,000 in one night. And that's when I was like, holy, it kicked my butt. But I was like, holy cow, this is like actually really cool. And people are so excited about it. So I, I called a friend and I built a website. It was just like on a Wix platform. It was super, super duper cheap. Like I said, I didn't have any money. And I was taking everything that I was making and I was literally rolling it back into my company. Um, my husband was super busy in grad school, so I didn't have a ton of help there. And I was still raising my three little kids. Um, so I would work, I would get the kids up, hang out with them, I'd put them to bed, and I would work seriously probably until like three or four in the morning. I would ship, I would email, I would cut and sew. And this happened for probably like three months. Then finally I realized like, oh my gosh, this is killing me. My most important thing here is my kids and my family, but I'm like a zombie. I can't function. So I knew I needed to hire something. It was, it was really scary because that's money that you have to pay somebody else. But I knew I needed it and I needed to be more present for my kids. So the first person I brought on was my nanny. She came in and helped me with my kids. And I had her come in like three days a week just to be in the house with me, with the kids, so I could function and do certain things like three hours a day. Super helpful. Um, I was still cutting and sewing at that point and 
I realized as the demand was getting more and more and more and people were becoming more and more interested and we were growing super fast on social media, um, that the next step was I needed to find somebody to help me sew, like I needed manufacturing because I learned a lesson early on with JMR that I knew myself and I knew I'd burn out. And my biggest strength wasn't sitting behind a sewing machine sewing rompers. So I found a manufacturer and it was a lot of money to fund. And that was the first time I asked for help with finances. And my dad loaned me, I think it was $6,000 was all I've ever taken um, to fund the first round of production in manufacturing. And I got that and I got everything manufactured. I sent the patterns, I, I figured it out. That was a huge feat in and of itself and we can go kind of more into that. Um, and I realized then that now I had all this product but I was sitting behind a computer all day answering emails and shipping and I wasn't able to grow and that was kind of my biggest strength was the marketing aspect and to grow and to get it out there and kind of tell people our story. Now that I had the product, I, I wasn't like hand sewing, it wasn't like crazy labor intensive, I had it all made. So my second hire was somebody to come in and help with customer service and help with shipping. Um, I think early on when you start a company, one of the most important things is to learn to really self-evaluate and understand what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. I knew that my strengths were in marketing and I knew that my strengths were, I knew exactly who my target market was. I knew exactly who I wanted to have my brand. When you go into clothing, you guys probably know this, brand protection is super duper important. You wanna be really specific on who is gonna carry or wear your brand, or I did. So I knew I didn't belong behind a computer or shipping. I needed somebody that could be really organized and could help me with that. And I was so scared to do that because the person that was helping me was somebody I really cared about and I knew they needed the money and it all kind of came on my shoulders. If I didn't perform, I wasn't gonna be able to pay this person, super duper scary. Um, but I remember we did $10,000 in the month of July. I hired this person to help with August and we jumped to $40,000 that month. So the jump was like, it was like a no-brainer. Hiring this person totally, completely paid for themselves and I was able to focus on what I needed to do and, and I, was I was spreading the word in marketing. Um, so that was a huge lesson learned and it made it a little less scary to keep hiring and figuring out, okay, what, what other things are not my strengths and where I can fill the seats on the bus. Um, so a lot of what I just described to you is kind of how I got the idea, how I developed the idea and we were growing and how to kind of keep up with the growth. I actually still feel like we're still like this. And, and it's like every day, every month I'm like, oh, I can't wait till next month. Like I'll have a normal life, like I'm gonna figure this out. And then it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think that's just something that entrepreneurs were all, are always gonna face is try to figure out how you can scale. But my biggest piece of advice there was to figure out what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And everybody's gonna be wearing a million different hats and you'll learn that and I'm sure some of you already have, but, and they're gonna be like that in the beginning, but as soon as you can and you can segment out those positions, do it. And it's a risk, but usually it pays off times, times 10. Um, so they, they also wanted me to talk a little bit about the funding. I, I mentioned to you guys, um, I, I went to my dad and asked him to help fund my first round of production. And that was the only money we've ever taken. So I took $6,000 essentially and we grew it into a multi-million dollar company. And a lot of that comes from, I think we took a product, there was a, there was a product that wasn't available in the market and there was a problem in the market and we solved it. And we were able to tell that story, um, which was huge. And a lot of discipline. Like, when you see money starting to come into your account like that, it's really easy to go out and buy a really cool car or buy a really sweet house or buy, and you have to stay really disciplined. I, I remember I took every dime and I literally rolled it back in. I barely paid myself. In fact, my employees were making more money than I was. Luckily, at the time, my husband was able to find a good job to help supplement that because I don't know if I would have been able to do that had he not found a job. But because we weren't, 
depending on me and my income at this point, I was able to take a lot of this money and roll it back in to the company. In fact, when I was on Shark Tank, that was one of the questions that they asked, like, what do you do with all that money? And I think the results would have been a lot different had I said, oh, I pay myself, I take it. You know, They were really impressed with the fact that I was disciplined enough to roll it back in to the company. And I think that's a huge, huge thing that entrepreneurs need to learn and not get too ahead of yourselves and get too excited because just recently, we, I haven't, I, we, we will launch on Nordstrom. And that's a huge vendor. And if I didn't have cash in the bank, because Nordstrom works on different terms than most boutiques, if I didn't have a ton of cash in the bank, I don't know if we would have been able to make that possible because you have to order out a ton of inventory for a vendor just like that. So it's lessons like that. If you want to grow, you want to be able to have the cash to grow it, and you got to stay really disciplined. Um, some of the, so as, as we were growing, we, we started, like I said, we started at like 2,000 followers, I think, on Instagram, and we've grown to 160,000, but in the last two years. So it's actually gotten quite big quite fast. But I think a lot of that was the marketing was really easy for me to figure out who my target market was and who my consumer is. Um, that's because that's me. I was my own market, I am my own consumer, so it was really easy to kind of define who I want to tell this story to and who I want to market to. Um, in the beginning, I actually would set aside when I was making them, and I wasn't making a ton of money, I think I probably gave out around $200 worth of product every single week. But when I would give it to the right people, and they got it, and they would post about it just through social media alone, sometimes that $20 romper that I, that I sent, that I sewed and I sweat, like blood, sweat and tears all over that thing. It was super hard to send sometimes because it was a lot of time and my time was really important because I have a family and I didn't sleep. But sometimes I would send that romper and just one post would bring in $1,000 worth of sales that day. So I think a lot of people don't understand that give, give, give. If you have a product that you like or that you're selling or if you're starting a company and you have something, give it away, let people try it. The coolest part about that was social media, I know you guys all know uh, social media, it was like a snowball effect. We ended up becoming, we, we were issued, I think Huffington Post was the first major publication, I didn't know about it, it was all totally organic because of our social media following and all of the organic chatter that was going on and everybody that had gotten our product, it was like a snowball effect. After that, Vogue featured us twice, all of these were things that had just come, and I was like, people would tell me like, hey, congrats on the Huffington Post, no clue. Like, what? So I would go look and be like, oh my gosh, that's totally there. Or the same with Vogue. And then um, recently we're, we were just in Forbes. But to, to know that it all started from Instagram, and I was giving away so much of my product so that people could try it, and then from there, it all organically really took off because People were tagging and talking, and then other moms wanted to buy it, and it became like a snowball effect. But that was also a really hard lesson to learn, and I remember reaching out to people, and that was probably some of the best advice I'd ever heard was give, 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 give. And a lot of times, I see entrepreneurs that come, and they're working so hard, and they ask, like, how did you grow so fast? I always tell them, give your product away. Find the people that you want to have your product and give it. Give it away. And it's so hard for them to wrap their brain around, and I get it. I was making no money, and to give away $200 of my own money was really tough. But to see the return on that really quickly, especially nowadays, we have like an immediate response. We have social media, it's immediate. Um, that was a really cool lesson to learn. Um, some of our major problems, I think when you go into business, you're gonna expect problems. If you don't, you're gonna be really surprised. They happen all the time. I think people laugh at me because it's always something new every single day. But one thing that I've always tried to do is just keep perspective and understand like there's 161,000 people on Instagram following us or Facebook that we have, we have Facebook groups and whatever. They don't understand or see what's happening behind the scenes. And that really, really helped me as far as like keeping a perspective on what my problems were. Um, one of the, the biggest one, I think, for me was manufacturing. When you're going into a business or when you're starting something new, a lot of this stuff is new. Nobody teaches you how to manufacture, especially myself. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. 
so that was always like a really big learning experience. And, and I was asking one of my employees today, like, hey, what do you think like one of our biggest problems are? And he said the same thing, manufacturing. And I was like, well, what do you think solved that? And he said, it's not solved. It's just something that we're constantly trying to improve. And it's so much better than it was a year ago and so much better than it was the year prior. What's really interesting was, it goes back to my thing about perspective was I think I was on the phone with Stance Socks. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Stance, but they have created a product that's Socks, and it's like a billion dollar company. And they've been somebody that I've really looked up to as far as culture and the way they've grown their company. Um, I was talking to them two days ago, and they, they want to work with us on a project, and we're trying to figure that all out. But it was really funny, because they were sending me Socks, and they were like, last year our sock was too thick. The year before that, our sock was too thin. And this year we're hoping, like we want to send you some socks and we're hoping it's perfect. And in the back of my head, I was like nodding to Mitch, like see, like we're not the only idiots. Like these guys are still doing it. They're still trying, they're still like learning because sometimes you really are like, holy cow, like is it this hard for everybody? I swear I like keep learning this lesson over and over and over. But to hear a guy that you really deem is like, holy cow, you've made it, to say like, yeah, last year it didn't work, the year before that it didn't really work, we're really gonna shoot for this year, like let us know how it goes. It made me feel so much better about what we're doing and really puts things into perspective that people face challenges like this all the time and it's just a matter of being persistent and understanding that, keeping it in perspective and just moving forward, obviously, in the right direction and trying to focus on that. Um, a huge question I always get is, where's the time? I don't want to go over. Under. Okay. A huge question that I always get um, from people that are starting is, how did you gain so much traction? And I think I, I talked a lot about that and just reiterating, like figure out who your target market is. For me, it was super duper easy because I am my own consumer. Like I'm a mom, I have young kids, I want something that looks good, that's easy to put on, so it's functional, and then also fashionable. So once I figured that out, it was really easy to market. I think a lot of times people start businesses because they want to make a quick buck. And I don't know how easy it is to get away with that nowadays. I think you really have to believe in what you're starting and what you're doing because of social media and because platforms like that, it's so transparent that if you're not really super passionate about it or you don't really know who and why you're doing this, people will catch on and it won't be as attractive. I think a lot of people were able to see themselves in me and understand like, hey, this girl's a mom. She's selling a product that's really easy to get on and off my kid. If this can make my life a little bit easier, I'm going to do it. Um, so I really do think that helps a ton, believing in your product and not trying to, I feel like money will come. Like, that's huge. If you love what you're doing, if you're happy, if you're passionate about it, money will come. Um, you don't need a lot to live, trust me. Um, let's see. I wrote some notes. I'm just going to keep... So, like you, like you guys heard, I was lucky because we were able to build our company on social media. So it was, and I think any company, like I've, I've talked to massive companies that don't have any social media presence. I think any company would be silly not to go that route and, and start pushing that. And maybe all of you guys have seen a ton of bigger companies going that route because the response through those outlets is immediate. You can get feedback literally in one second, whether you like it or not. And a lot of the times we'll test product, we'll throw it on there, and we'll test it just to see if it will get a reaction. If it does, we'll roll with it and put it into production and go for it. If it doesn't, we'll pull it. So that's something that's really beneficial, and I think a lot of companies are starting to take advantage of that now. Um, and it doesn't need to cost you anything. It's, you know, Social media is free. So that was a big one. Um, hiring was another huge one. I think I, I touched on that. It was really scary, but the return on that investment was massive. Like I said, the first employee that I hired to help with customer service and shipping, I was doing $10,000 the month before. And once I hired this employee, it was like I had a mental shift. And I understood, like, cool, I have help, and now I can just blast this everywhere because 
before I was like praying that people wouldn't order. I was like, no, like more, this just means more, no sleep, you know? So now I was like, yes, blast it. Like we have somebody in there that can help us and we're able to grow. So, and, and a similar story happened six months down the road. I, my next really big hire, we went from 40 grand that month to 80. It literally doubled. So hiring and figuring out what your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and hiring out those weaknesses and keeping that culture is like unbelievably important. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm just curious uh, with that, it's, it sounds like those were specific challenges you faced. Looking back, is there anything that you would do differently? I know you, you've changed, you're pivoting, you're, you're still moving forward. Is there anything specific you would do differently in hindsight that you wish you would have done? Or as far as just in general? Yeah. That's, that's a broad question. I know. I mean, I, when people ask me that, because I get asked that all the time, I would say no, because a lot of the mistakes that I've made have brought me to where I'm at now. And there's been a lot of lessons learned. Um, luckily, we haven't had like major massive problems. But I think I've been really, really conscious on who I hire, who I surround myself with, who I work with. Um, and that's like more important to me than the actual product that we're selling. And I think if all those things align, then it bleeds through you and it bleeds through your company and things start falling into place. So. I mean, I've actually aligned myself with some really nasty people, but luckily my gut instinct was right, and I was able to get rid of them and move on. So it hadn't affected our business the way it could have. Yeah. So I was curious, you talked about your first hire or two. Yeah. Um, you at that point with your company, how big of a deal was like, okay, I need to make enough money to justify hiring versus taking the risk and then hoping you make it back? Like, did that way of, was that a huge factor? So you're asking like how much, did I have to think about, okay, this is how much I need to make in order to bring this person on? Was that ever like, okay, once I get to this much revenue, then I'll hire someone, or did it go the other way for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you'd be silly not to think that way. Obviously, that was a concern. For me, it was more, I knew the value of my time, and I knew that was stuff that I wasn't very good at, and I knew if I did it, I wouldn't let myself fail. So, if, so in other words, if I was going to hire somebody on, I wasn't going to let myself fail and not bring that revenue into the company. It was allowing me to get like free up my time to do exactly what I knew I needed to do and that was marketing. Marketing. Maybe I was a little bit overconfident because I didn't think through that process a ton, but it did bring more pressure on and I realized like I can't fail these people. Like I was pulling the this the next hire, I he was he was coming from a really great job and he had a family. So I was like I can't fail this person. Like if we fail, I not only let him down, but I let his whole family down. So I think it just pushed me harder just to hustle, you know? And it totally panned out. Yeah? So knowing what you know now as the company would continue to grow and, and create more revenue, if you could go back, do you think it would have been in your benefit to take larger loans, more than just that initial $6,000? Would that have allowed you to grow more quickly? Or do you think that would have just been a larger burden? I think it would have been a larger burden. I think you have to be really, really careful on how you grow. Like if you over, I've seen so many companies, this is what I was really afraid of, was growing too fast. So I really needed to hit the market and I needed, to, I needed to do it at a good pace so that I could be the leader in what I wanted to do. So I wanted to be the best of the rompers. I wanted to be the biggest and the best. Everybody's copying us now, but I wanted to be like the forefront. But I knew that if I grew too fast, we would sink. And I think if I took on more money and I, and I tried to do that, all the lessons that I had learned, I was so grateful we were still so small and flexible. If I was bigger at that point, it would have been a massive hit financially. Like we've had full runs of manufacturing just go to garbage. And if I was at a, a greater scale and I had pushed finances and I had made, us, made this thing massive right off the beginning, that would have been a huge blow. It could have taken us totally out. So I think slow and steady, but follow your instincts. And once you know like it's critical to start growing, you'll know. You can feel it. Yeah. So I went to the Sharks because I wanted their, actually they asked me this, that's a good question. So I went in there and they asked, I, I don't know if you guys seen, I don't know, I'll, I'll kind of just walk you through that process. When I went on there, we had three Sharks fighting for my company, which was really cool, but it's all super duper authentic. Like they don't tell the Sharks anything about my company. They don't tell you anything. So 
when I went on there, they asked me, like, well, how much cash do you have? And I had $250,000 in my bank, cash, debt-free, and I had to tell them that I had to disclose that. And I was asking for $200,000. So they obviously asked, well, why the heck are you here? You, you're asking for less than what you already have. And you don't really need us. Like, you have more of a following than we do. So I told them, and it's true, I was like, if I needed cash, I would have walked into a bank and got that investment. But that's not why I was there. I was there because their expertise, like their connections, their brain power, the, their teams that they would bring in to help us, and then also the exposure. Like, it's priceless. It's really great to get people aware. And I thought my story would have been inspiring and kind of cool, you know? But more than anything, like when, when I did get asked that question, it was, I like, I wanted the person and not the money. That wasn't that important to me. So, did you have a question? Um, how did you find a good manufacturer and like, what were the steps to, in that? Yeah, super good question. Uh, that's so hard to do, to be honest. And it's really funny because manufacturers don't put their information online because they're afraid of like moms like me walking in there and being like, hey, like this is a hobby, I want to make 30, and then never returning, you know? That's money in the bank, that's, that's money they're losing because they have to train their customers on how to sew or make your product, right? So um, I did a ton of research and I asked around. I actually asked some clothing companies that I knew that were local, um, and they had used this manufacturer here in Provo, um, which was great because I was able to go in and they actually turned me away. I called the guy and I was like, hey, I have a product. And, and to their credit, like, I'm sure they got that all the time. Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, 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 totally blew me off. So I walked in there one day with my product, and I was like, can you do this? Like, can you make it? What are your minimums? It was 400 pieces. And I remember I was like, holy crap, that's so many. But I ended up doing like 2,500 in the beginning. So <laughs> 400 just seemed daunting. Um, anyway, so. But they, they weren't actually a good fit. Like, we went through four rounds of production with them, and it was really sloppy. So that's what was a massive problem, super intimidating, because like I said, not a lot of manufacturers uh, promote that they're sewing and selling. There is stuff that you can get on. It's called Maker's Row for clothing. I don't know other products, but it's called Maker's Row, and it's in L.A. And you can go on there, and you can type in, like, I want to make a swimsuit. And all the manufacturers that make swimsuit will pop up. So that was really cool. I ended up flying out to LA. I found a manufacturer that could do it. They made samples and they were so good. I remember looking at it and being like, dude, this thing looks like it could be in Target. This is like the best quality ever, like great quality. Um, so I called my dad and I was like, hey, can you go into the manufacturer down in Provo and ship me all my fabric? I think he loaded 10 U-Hauls full of fabric and shipped them out to LA because the, the production there was just not up to par. Um, and we've been in LA ever since, and it's been amazing. So once you find a good manufacturer, stay there, stay there. It's gold. And for me, that's like massively important, huge value. Yeah? Yeah, I was wondering what shocks did it bring you with, and how often did you put yourself in? Was that actually a big help? Yeah, so Shark Tank is massive. Like they tell you, I think there's 9 million viewers that watch that show. But this is still more nervous. Like I get more nervous here. Um, I got an offer from Robert, Damon, and uh, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful. Do you guys watch that show? Yeah. So they, um, they all were like fighting about it. And before you go in there, you don't know like if you're going to get a deal. So you, I, I did research on all of the sharks, but I did the most on the people that I was the most interested in. But at the same time, I was like, dude, if anybody offers me anything, I have to like consider this. Like, I didn't know what was gonna happen. You know, it's seriously like a wild card. So Damon, um, he's the guy that does FUBU, uh, and so he would be like, everybody would be like, oh yeah, she's gonna for sure go with Damon. Like, he's into clothes. Kevin O'Leary, to be super honest, like he's he's more of like a shark, a venture capitalist. So I didn't do like a ton of research on Kevin because I didn't know if I wanted to work with him. I would have if I had to, but I didn't want to. I didn't know if I wanted to. And then uh, Robert was more in security, but he, he invested in a company called Tipsy Elves. Are you guys familiar with them? So they do like really ugly holiday sweaters, but they turned, I think they, they're killing it. Like they were doing a ton of revenue. So I was really super interested in Robert um, too, because he had that company and I had done a lot of research on them. So when I went in there, Damon basically offered, he was like, you need to rip yourself off. You need to sell to, 
to Walmart and Children's Place. And Robert was like, no, 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 no. You need to stay true to your brand. You need to stay true to your customer, your consumer. And you need to build your online base, like your online base. So deciding between the two, Kevin O'Leary, I don't even remember what he said. My brain <laughs> was like, I was like, OK, Kevin, OK. I don't even remember, because anyway. Um, so I went with Robert because basically it all came down to who sees my vision. And I think that goes down to seriously every single person I've even hired or brought on was who understands like the vision of my company. And at the end of the day, it was Robert. A ton of people were like, why didn't she go with Damon? Oh my gosh. It was a big giant thing, but they edit out so much. I was in there for two hours negotiating. So yeah, they edit out a ton. But yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Hopefully you guys learned something.